Hey guys, my name is Jess from Stellar Tarot and I want to welcome you to my first of two Self Love September videos. If you don't know what Self Love September is, I want you to pause the video and go and check the uh, link that I've left in the down bar here. Uh, so, uh, Kellyanne from KellyanneMaddox.com has been doing this Self Love September event every year for a few years now. So all of September she puts out tons of content on YouTube, on SoundCloud. She does these master classes and these big packages where all she does is help people make self love part of their routine. She does it out of the love of her own heart and because she knows the value of um, incorporating self-love practices into what you do for yourself. Uh, it can severely, significantly impact your mental health with your relationship with yourself, your personal growth, and your spiritual path. This year I've decided that I want to chime in too, and I've done that with her permission and her blessing. And I'm actually gonna tackle um, self-love for like new age witchy mamas, which is something that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, I've been a practicing witch now since I was 12 years old, so that's now more than 20 years of my life. And I am a proud parent. I am a mother of two children that I've had of my own uh, body that I have produced myself and I'm also a step parent and this is my second time around being a step parent. I was briefly a stepmom for a, a teenage boy when um, I was married the first time and even though I uh, am no longer with him and I don't uh, talk to my former stepson anymore, it was a huge learning experience for me and definitely laid the foundations of some of the things that I do now as a mother in a blended family. So this video is going to uh, tackle self-care for uh, witchy mamas in um, who are experiencing the pregnancy and uh, early infancy stage. So all the tips I'm going to give you, I am keeping in mind because either your body is growing and developing a human, or I am keeping in mind that you um, are now postpartum, your body has changed a fair bit, and you now have a small child who is completely dependent on you 24-7. So the um, self-love tips that I'm going to give in my second video will take into account more um, the uh, increasing independence that your child will have from you in their later years. So this one, we are just talking self-love tips for pregnancy and infancy. Before I get into the tips, I want to make something really, really clear. I really believe that before we um, not even before, that, that as mothers, we have a constant growing, expanding, and changing expectation of what we should look like, do, accomplish, be in charge of, and be able to handle with grace and ease from society's perspective. We don't have a village situation for the most part anymore in a westernized culture. For the most part, families live in their own homes, on their own properties, or rent their own apartments, and they are not always uh, living close to relatives or people who can be part of a big support system. We no longer have this village aspect where a mother could go and, you know, fetch water from the well a kilometer away while another mother looks after your child for a few minutes. So a lot of the tips that I am going to be offering in these videos is designed to kind of help to um, alleviate some of the stress that comes from us having to be independent as um, family units and do a lot of the stuff for ourselves that we could have often expected a whole group of people to be chipping in and contributing towards. Obviously, there are a whole bunch of factors that differentiate us from 
village life, there are things that we don't have to do that uh, village villagers in a village life setting would have to do, like raising our own food and produce. We don't have to raise livestock and care for them. We don't have to um, weave our own clothing or things like that anymore. But we do have other responsibilities that can take up time in our lives, like going to nine to find jobs and stuff like that. Um, and a little bit of background info on myself as well. I live in Canada. And in Canada, we have a one year of paid maternity leave uh, from your job. I'm aware that in the States that that is not always the case. So some of the tips that I may include here may not be accessible to everyone from whatever westernized country you are part of because of the situation that you may find yourself in. But I did try to include as many as possible so that you can kind of take what works for you and leave what you know is not really applicable or is not going to be um, part of your lifestyle. So let's get into the first one and that is uh, choosing the right kind of clothing for the situation that you're in. When I was pregnant with both of my children, I kept only as a very small part of it in mind the stylish nature of my maternity clothing. For the most part, I was concerned with functionality and comfort. The only real specific purchase of purchases that I made for myself during my pregnancies was to have um, the right kind of white button down or you know dress shirts that I needed for working in my jobs as a pharmacy assistant, which is part of my uniform, and I didn't really have a choice. And um, dresses or uh, some fancier clothing that I needed for uh, attending weddings or other events that I was going to while I was pregnant. I didn't have any fancy events to attend when I was pregnant with my son, but I did have um, a wedding to go to as well as a couple of other fancy things when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, so I just made sure that my clothes worked and that they were comfortable. I got as many versatile pieces so that I could mix and match and I made sure that everything that I got was machine washable and dryable because the last thing I wanted to be doing was hand washing my maternity clothes. The hormone changes that you experience when you're pregnant mean that your body is going to be changing and also your body's responses to certain things like stress, heat, cold and other things like that can change too. I made sure that pretty much almost all of my maternity clothes were made out of um, plant-based fibers that breathed and with the couple of exceptions of a couple of dress shirts that I had which had like some poly cotton blends and stuff like that pretty much all of my clothes were totally breathable because definitely especially in that last trimester that little belly became my little personal baby oven and I was always hot, which is something that I am almost never unless it is the middle of the summer where I am. The rest of the year, I'm almost always cold to some level and I bundle up like crazy. But that wasn't the case for me when I was pregnant. Postpartum, my clothing choices had to be really, really conscious for the first few weeks after giving birth. With my son, I had this gigantic belly still that was, you know, starting to slowly deflate that I had to take into consideration. I thought my uh, maternity jeans were only going to be worn during my pregnancy. It wasn't until after I had given birth that I realized that I actually still needed quite a bit of extra room on my waistband area from my pants. Um, yoga pants and sweatpants became uh, types of clothing that I lived in when I was at home because they were far more comfortable accommodating the giant maxi pads that I needed for all of the uh, bleeding that took place after delivery and um, they also made taking naps at unexpected times really easy too because they were basically pajama pants and um, the same kind of went for after I delivered because I had a c-section with my second child I would only wear certain pants um, for the first uh, couple of weeks because I had my incision that I had to take into consideration. All of my maternity jeans were completely out the door. I couldn't wear them because they sat and the, the seams sat and rubbed right on my incision area and that was painful. I pretty much had two pairs of uh, 
pants that I rotated between for those first couple of weeks after. One of them was a pair of uh, beaver canoe sweatpants that I got that had a really big wide waistband and I could pull it up and over my incision area. And another pair was um, a yoga pants that had one of those fold over waistbands and I could keep it folded over so that it sat underneath my incision and it was far more comfortable that way. And that's the thing, when you are pregnant or after you've delivered, your clothing isn't gonna fit right for the first while. I think it's very important that you not rush to feel like you have to lose your baby weight and that you shouldn't have to feel like you have to rush to fit back into your pre-pregnancy clothing. What matters for you and what matters for your baby after you deliver is that you guys are comfortable, that you're getting enough sleep, that you're eating, that you're drinking enough, and that you are fed. You know, that you are happy and healthy and able to support the bonding experience that comes after delivery. And if you are worried, more concerned about the stylish nature of your clothing, then you're taking away from one of the most important experiences of motherhood, and that is that um, bond that happens during and after pregnancy. The second thing I'd like to point out to is to minimize caffeine. This is not just f so that you are not going to be depending on it as much after you deliver, but it is also because caffeine can impede flow to the baby through the placenta, uh, the blood flow. So that means that your baby could be getting less oxygen and less nutrients because the caffeine can restrict the blood vessels. Caffeine is a diuretic as well. And so it will dehydrate you if you're drinking too much of it and it is going to impact the um, your ability to fall asleep. I think it's important to minimize the caffeine during the pregnancy so that after you give birth, uh, you won't be drinking quite as much as of it then. And that means that when you are able to take advantage of those little pockets of time to have a nap, you won't be fighting the buzz from caffeine that can keep you from sleeping when you are, you know, even when you are seriously sleep deprived in those first few months after baby is born. Um, I had to really watch my caffeine intake when I was pregnant with my second because I was having a lot of placenta issues. So I allowed myself only one cup of caffeinated tea in the morning. And then I just bought decaf tea for the rest of the day. I really love drinking tea. And so I did not want to miss out on that. I wanted to be able to continue to do it, but I also didn't want to be negatively impacting my baby. I found after I delivered that um, I continued this pattern and to this day I still have two cups of caffeine in the morning, maybe three for those nights when I don't get as much sleep as I usually do. The rest of the tea that I drink during the day for the most part with you know odd exceptions here and there is either a decaf orange pico so that I can simulate what I would have in the morning, a decaf earl grey where I will drink herbal blends. Occasionally I'll throw in a chai tea in there which has caffeine, but it doesn't happen very often. Something else I'd like to point out too is that when you are pregnant, you may find that other people are drawn to your belly, drawn so much that they feel that they have the right to lay their hands on you. You may also find the same thing with your baby when you are out in public. People may want to come up and touch your baby's hair or their face or their little hands or feet. And it's up to you to decide what your comfort level with that sort of thing is. When I was pregnant with my son, Andrew, I had effectively a dream pregnancy. I had no complications, no issues. I did not experience any morning sickness. And I was able to deliver naturally on my due date. The only medication that I used in hospital was a little bit of morphine because my labor came on very quickly and intense. And um, for, for the while there, my, my uh, contractions were so intense that I was having a really hard time I uh, coping with them. So they gave me half doses of morphine only twice during my labor and that was it. Um, I didn't use uh, nitrous oxide or laughing gas and I didn't have an epidural or any other sort of medication. And I was very proud of this. 
And I had no problem letting people touch my, my stomach as long as they asked first, as long as they were people that I knew and that I was comfortable with. I very rarely actually ever had strangers attempt to put their hands on my body. Um, I was working at a pharmacy at the time, so I did see a lot of my regular patients on a regular basis. And every once in a while, one of them would ask if they could feel my belly. And with the ones that, um, I don't think I ever actually turned any of them down now that I think about it. I think all the ones that asked were ones that I felt very comfortable being around them and I didn't mind at all. Um, but the story, with my daughter Emily was quite different. Um, when I was pregnant with Andrew, every kick, every movement was exciting. It was a bonding experience. It felt good. And I just felt sexy and just damn good the whole time that I was pregnant with Andrew. And I didn't feel like that when I was pregnant with Emily. I felt uncomfortable all the time. And every kick and movement often ended up in me being um, in pain or uncomfortable because of where and how she was sitting and because of the circumstances that I was in. A lot of people asked me if they could feel my stomach and I denied almost all of them with I think the exception of my husband, my mother, uh, my son Andrew and my daughter Morgan at the time and I think a couple of other family members. For the most part when people went to go and try to touch me when I was pregnant, I recoiled physically. I had three doctors tending to me and I went through a battery of tests and ultrasounds and visits and I was sick and tired of being poked and prodded by others. So I really seriously limited the amount of physical contact that I was having, even with my loved ones. I just, sometimes it literally made my skin crawl and I hated it. After she was born, I went through a similar type of phase with how I felt about other people touching her. You know, we had got through this such difficult pregnancy. I delivered uh, two weeks early and it had to be by a pre-planned C-section, which I was terrified of having. I hated the fact that I wasn't even allowed to try to have a natural delivery. I hated that they wouldn't try to turn her from breech to head down so that I could attempt to have a normal delivery. And the idea of being cut open to have my child made me very emotional, very upset. And I had a really hard time with coming to terms with the scar that I ended up with after I delivered. I set some pretty intense boundaries for the people who could touch me during my pregnancy and after. And I recommend that you define for yourself what your boundaries are too. And know that you don't have to justify those boundaries to other people, especially perfect strangers. If you don't want them to touch your child, just say, please don't touch my child. Thank you. If they ask why, you don't have to explain. It can be a very easy thing to just say, I'm just not comfortable with it. Thank you. Thank you for respecting my decision. You don't have to explain why you have the boundaries that you do. You just have to make sure that you are clear with them because ultimately it's your body and it's your child. And when you are not feeling like your boundaries are constantly being crossed, that can be a big peace of mind right off the bat. I'm gonna just mention this one really briefly because I think it goes without saying, but I think it's also really important to you know, rehash it once more. And that's to eat and that's to drink. As new moms, especially late in pregnancy and um, early uh, after delivery, it can be very easy to forget to eat and it can be very easy to forget to drink water. But especially if you are breastfeeding, the water is one of the most important things that you need because if you are dehydrated, your milk supply will be greatly, greatly impacted by that. I'm someone who is able to breastfeed both of my two children, and for whatever reason, I produced a crap ton of milk. But not everyone is able to do that. So my next point is don't beat yourself up over how you end up feeding your child. Everyone, I think, especially in this day and age, we're, we're really getting back to grassroots of mothering. There's this 
big message out there that breast is best. But not everyone is able to breastfeed properly. Some of us, especially in the States, may not be given the amount of time off of work in order to stay home and breastfeed our child exclusively for months or years. Some of us just dry up. Some of us make enough milk to feed a couple of kids. And some of us make just enough for the child and that's it. And you have to supplement on top of that even sometimes. Some of us have to take um, things like Domperidone in order to keep the supply up or mother's milk teas or other things like that. And at the end of the day, is your child fed? Then that is what is best. My sister-in-law gave birth to two babies who at first were breastfeeding like dreams and they were suckling good, latching perfectly, and then things started to go wrong for them health-wise. They weren't putting on weight, they weren't thriving, and they tried to figure out why. And it turned out that both of them had allergies to milk protein. And even though my sister-in-law was able to produce enough milk for them, she eventually had to change them over to soy-based formula in order to keep them from having the uh, issues with the milk allergy. Uh, both of my children I was able to breastfeed, although with Andrew, he was a curious and energetic kid right from the get-go and he would pop off the boob and get distracted by something at a moment's notice and I would be shooting milk everywhere and getting him to focus long enough to get enough to feed was getting challenging if not almost impossible. He also got to the point for a while there while he was only willing to breastfeed while we were laying down in bed and that was just not conducive to real life. I was going to be out and about in places and he was going to get hungry at some of those times. And if I couldn't feed him when we were out, that was a problem for me because I couldn't always find a place to actually physically lie down. So it's really important to just remember that you do what you have to do to keep you and your child fed because while breast may be best in most situations, fed is best for all situations. All. And let's not forget that whole village setting. If you were one of those moms who made milk, but not enough to feed your child, there would be other mothers who would supplement from their own breasts at the same time as well. Uh, wet nursing was a thing up until only quite recently, and that's not bad. And in fact, my Emily needed to receive some donated milk while she was still in the hospital after birth because she was growing fast and I wasn't bringing in my milk fast enough. And um, so they needed to make sure that she gained weight at the right and healthy amount of time. And so, you know, don't be afraid. Uh, if you are the type of person living in the right situation to wet nurse other kids or have your own child wet nurse, if you can have access to that kind of thing, that is okay too. This idea that it all has to come from you is quite new in modern medicine and I think in a lot of cases it is unrealistic. Something that I really felt was important too during both of my pregnancies was to invest on, in some hands-on healing or care of some kind. When I was pregnant with Andrew, I um, had to invest in some chiropractic care, and I also got um, a really, really good uh, pedicure with massage that was designed for someone um, who was pregnant. And that was because I was retaining a lot of water when I was pregnant with him. And I needed someone to really work my feet and leg muscles because I stood a lot at work and walked a lot at work. But I also needed it to help with the water uh, retention that was in my legs and to get some of that blood flow moving again. When I was pregnant with Emily, I actually was going to go and get a pregnancy massage, but ironically enough, the person who was trained to do it, the only one I could find in town who had that set up at their facility, the, massa the, the massage therapist was on maternity leave herself. <laughs> so I ended up settling for the Skookum uh, pedicure package with like the paraffin wax treatment and everything on my feet and it was amazing but 
to me, those were essential when I was pregnant. The amount of changes that my body was going through and the amount of energy and work that it was doing to grow a human meant that I needed to take care of myself in other ways that wasn't necessarily always part of my normal uh, physical self-care routine. And if you can afford to have somebody do that for you, then do it. But if not, know that there are loads of free resources online for things like how to give pregnancy massage, how to do um, foot and leg massages and things like that. There's YouTube videos. There are books at the library. There are so many different things, podcasts and stuff like that, that you can have access to that don't cost a thing. And if you have a partner that's willing to put in a little bit of time and learn a new skill, you will have the ability to incorporate some of that stuff into your self-care. And don't knock being able to do some of that self-care for your stuff as well. Uh, you know, give yourself a pedicure when baby goes down for a nap or if you're able to reach down and, and reach your feet. Soak them in some, some warm water with essential oils and give them a good rub with your favorite foot cream and maybe paint your toenails or things like that. Do things for yourself that feel good and take care of yourself just because it feels good. And it doesn't have to just be massage, massages or pedicures either. Invest in Reiki or hands-on like touch for healing or other things like that. Um, Take yourself to a, uh, a guided meditation or something else. Whatever physical self-care thing that feels good for you, do that. Um, again, I think this probably goes without saying, but I'm going to mention it anyways. Get regular checkups for yourself and for your baby once your baby is born. Um, obviously, Western medicine isn't the, the wonder system that we are necessarily always uh, taught that it is when we are growing up but there are a lot of wonderful things about it and you can spot and treat uh, various problems if you are seeing your physician on a regular basis so whatever your um, health care system allows and whatever you can um, are able to manage for yourself and for your child I think it's important to see a professional of some kind medical related, be it a, uh, a doula or a midwife or a naturopathic practitioner or just a general um, OBGYN or general medicine doctor on a regular basis. Spot those things that could potentially be going wrong and treat them before they become problems. If you and your baby are operating at optimal health on a regular basis, it takes a huge amount of pressure off for everything else. Something that I think is really important to do is to avoid doing toxic comparison for yourself, how your own pregnancy, weight loss journey, after pregnancy, and health journey is, comparing it to other people, especially of um, similar timelines and things like that. It can be very easy to compare yourself to another woman and what her experiences are during pregnancy and um, as a mother afterwards as well. And that can lead to a lot of negative side effects for yourself after. Depression just being you know, only one of the, the many symptoms that can happen from that. And I think it's really important to remember that our experiences as women can be very different. And we may never be able to have, we may not even have two similar pregnancies back to back, let alone to be able to compare ourselves to women who have completely different bodies, health stories, um, emotional stories, upbringing, different challenges, all of that kind of stuff. Keep the, uh, the focus about what you're going through on you and what you're actually experiencing and minimize comparing yourself and your baby to other kids. I remember reading a book which I can't remember the name of or the author of, but I read it years ago after I'd had Andrew. And I remember her calling um, the phenomenon of uh, other mothers comparing each other's uh, babies and kids at different stages to each other as being called baby offs. Well, my little one learned how to talk at such and such stage. What's your one doing at this stage? And, you know, mine weighed this much and was in this percentile after delivery. And what was yours? And blah, blah, blah. Baby offs are something to be avoided at all costs. 
do not focus on the percentage, the what percentile for growth your child is in, except if it matters for your child's health. I cannot tell you the number of times that my doctors would tell me that my kid was in, you know, the, I don't know, the 75th percentile for weight, but she was in the 25th percentile for like height or something. And I went, okay, what am I supposed to do with this information? Nothing. My daughter is healthy. My son is healthy. They're eating. They're sleeping. They're peeing. They're pooping. They're talking. They are developing. They are smart. They are all of these things. Why do I need to know where they are on the height and weight category? They are things that you are not even going to be dealing with later on when you do your yearly checkups with kids once they become toddlers anyways. So why worry about it now? Unless your baby is having some actual weight or height or whatever issues that need to be dealt with on a regular basis by a healthcare practitioner, then Don't worry about it and definitely don't use those numbers as things that you can take away to compare to other children with. They're going to have, you know, their parents are going to have completely different body types to yours. Even comparing them to, you know, the babies of maybe your sisters or brothers or family members in general is not going to be very useful because I guarantee you that their pregnancy would have been different than yours, their physiology is different than yours, and their ch- their child's physiology is different than yours. Focus on you and focus on your child and what it's going to take to keep the both of you growing and you know just living life as healthfully as you possibly can. Preparing for things ahead of time can be a really key thing to self-care as well. Especially during those last, you know, that last month or two of your pregnancy when, um, you know, you're really kind of starting to to know that this is going to happen very soon. Being prepared ahead of time can be a really, really big self-care thing. When I was pregnant with both of my children, in that last month of my pregnancy, I spent a fair bit of time pre-cooking big batches of meals and freezing them and putting them in our big deep freezer. If this is something that you can do, I recommend it more than words can say. The number of times I was too tired to cook a meal, but I knew that we needed to get food on the table that night and was able to pull out a uh, pre-assembled like macaroni and cheese or things like that and stick it in the oven and warm it up were life savers. They were sanity savers. And it meant that we all had food on the table. It meant that we ate that night and that there is no going down to McDonald's or making that last minute phone call to Domino's or things like that. We were eating better than we would be if we were, you know, eating out again. Preparing by things like uh, going to the stores and buying the clothes that you're going to need for your child or thrift stores or things like that and setting them aside in boxes or bags pre-labeled with the size so that when you realize that your baby has outgrown the zero to three months and now nothing fits and you now need the six to 12 month stuff now can really help. You won't be doing that last minute digging while your child is screaming because they're cold and naked. You'll be able to pull that bag or that box out and grab that sleeper and grab that onesie and slap it on them and be good to go. The same thing goes, I think, for yourself too with your own clothing. Pack away some of those items that you know that you're not going to be fitting into for several months after you deliver and put them in a box somewhere. Don't have them hanging up in your closet or staring you in the face every time you open up your dresser drawers. Those can be really, really depressing to look at if you're in the wrong state of mind. If those things are put off to the side and ready when you are actually ready, they won't be always, you know, in your face staring you down going you still got 10 more pounds to lose before you can fit into me nobody needs that your most the most important things for your self-care after you have a baby is to take care of your physical self and your mental self to do the things that make you feel good and that keep you getting up every morning tending to your child and not feeling like you want to go take a long walk off a short pier Um, 
pre-cooking, cleaning, and organizing, they all kind of fall under that preparing ahead of time. Um, with my uh, last pregnancy with my daughter, we knew she was going, going to be born five days after Christmas. I knew that I was not going to have the energy to organize all of my kids' new toys right after giving birth, um, you know, right after Christmas time and New Year's. I knew that I wanted to be able to come back home to a house that was clean and organized and ready to receive me. So after, uh, before even Christmas time happened, I went through my kids' toys and clothes and I got rid of a bunch of stuff. Stuff that was broken, wasn't being used anymore. They had outgrown the, um, you know, outgrown like the, the age-wise and things like that or outgrown the use of. Anything that just I knew didn't fit into their life anymore. Anything that I knew that my soon-to-be-born daughter could use in the next year to year and a half, I then packed into boxes and put away in our storage room so that they were things I could pull out when it was ready for her. The time was right for her to use them. But anything that I knew was going to be more than like two to three years off before she could use, I, I just gave to donation or I sold on our local Facebook Bidding Wars group. After Christmas, I typically will um, on New Year's Eve or sorry New Year's Day. It is my custom to then take down my Christmas tree and all the Christmas decorations and put everything away. But I also knew that my C-section was planned for December 30th. So the day before, uh, my husband and I spent the day mostly with me supervising, but some helping packing away the Christmas tree and stuff. When we came home from the hospital on uh, January 2nd. We were completely ready to, to just move in, essentially. You know, the crib was set up, the bassinet was set up. We had receiving blankets and all sorts of things ready to go. All the Christmas stuff was long packed away and we didn't have to worry about spending the time putting that stuff away and managing a child as well. And it felt good to walk into a house that was ready to receive me. So consider doing some of that stuff before you leave. Get some of those big deep cleaning things done before you go to the hospital if you can, or get somebody to do them for you. You know, if you know that that oven needs to be cleaned but you're nine months pregnant, don't clean it yourself. Maybe hire a maid to come in and do it. You know, there's no shame in hiring somebody to do a service for you that you can't do yourself for a short time or get your partner or significant other to do it. Maybe ask if your mother, your aunt, a sibling or a friend can do some of that stuff for you or to help you do some of those things. If you want to come home and have that stuff ready to go, that's the perfect time to get it done is before you go to the hospital. Because especially if you end up having an emergency C-section, you're going to be very limited as far as what you can do um, uh, after you deliver for those first couple of weeks. Even driving is restricted, so keep that in mind too. Um, don't turn down help. I think that's really, really important. If somebody offers to come over and do the dishes for you, don't be embarrassed about the state of your kitchen. Let them do the dishes for you. Becoming a mother, if, especially for the first time, or as if you have other children to look after as well once you come home from the hospital, that in itself is a really big deal. That's a big thing to be responsible for. Um, if someone's offering to take one of those many responsibilities off your shoulder for a few minutes, please let them. Um, that was, and I had a very hard time accepting once I had had children, and I can tell you now, having had more than one, um, this the the when I had the second child and somebody came over and offered to load my dishwasher for me and run it for me, I was like, Hallelujah! Please, 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 you know in. If they're offering to do that stuff for you, it's generally because they know what it's like to be overloaded with things to do and to have one less thing sitting there on your plate for you to do after you put the child down for a nap or whatever. That's incredible to have that gift of the help. And if at all possible, delegate some of those things as well. If you have older children at home, put them in charge of loading or unloading the dishwasher. Put them in charge of taking out the garbage you put them in charge of making their own lunches for school if that means that you get an extra 15 minutes of time to sleep in in the morning you know when you have a new baby too find ways to minimize uh, the responsibilities that you have because you can't do it all and even if you can 
Why should you? The last thing I want to mention before we stop here is do what works for you as a parent. We live in the Google age and the self-help overload age, and it can be so overwhelming to look at all the advice from other parents about how you should parent your child, how you should establish a sleep schedule, how you should feed them, how you should do almost everything from dressing them to diapering them to whatever. You have enough decisions to make as it is about how you are going to do some of the simplest things right off the bat. Don't overwhelm yourself by only reading from a certain thing and treating it as gospel. Use your intuition, follow your gut, and do what works for you. You are the parent, you are in charge, and these are your children, and you have every right to make those decisions for yourself. If you feel uncomfortable implementing a certain type of parenting practice, even though all your friends may swear by it, don't do it. I used an amber teethy necklace with both of my kids and found that it worked wonders. But my sister-in-law tried it with her son and it instantly gave her the heebie-jeebies because she was constantly terrified her son would choke. So she gave it back to me and she washed her hands of it. Do the same thing. Even if your mother or mother-in-law is swearing up and down that this is the thing that worked for them and their children, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Follow your gut and stand your ground. You have every right to raise your child how you want. This is your turn to be the parent. Make it a pleasurable experience for yourself. Nobody is going to be um, giving you uh, stickers of approval if you follow their perfect way of raising their children. This has to be your decision and your decision only. Well, between you and your spouse, obviously. But this is when you get to call the shots. Take advantage of that and make sure that if you have people who are trying to cross that line and constantly shove their advice down your throat, that if you don't like it, you're allowed to tell them to stop. So I hope that you found these tips helpful. There wasn't a whole lot of spiritual stuff to this particular video because I think most of you will probably find that your spiritual path becomes quite condensed down to what works for you once you have children. This was more about just caring for you as a person, as yourself, as a mother during your pregnancy and in that, you know, that first year postpartum. So I hope you'll join me in a couple of weeks time for my next video where I talk about tips for the mama of uh, toddler and school age children. And until then, thank you for being here. Many blessings and talk to you soon. Mwah.